You hear it all the time that elk hunting is just like turkey hunting. Well, yes, no, and not really. Look here, y'all. There are absolutely skills and strategies that a turkey hunter can take into the woods that will help them out elk hunting. But there are also things that turkey hunters do that could actually hurt them in the elk woods. And if you go one step further, there are things about elk hunting that are nothing like turkey hunting. Who boy, do we have a great conversation lined up for this one. Today's topic, elk hunting and turkey hunting, the similarities and the differences and those things that are not even close. That discussion, our Elk Bros shout outs and questions from our awesome Elk Bros mailbox. So my friends, pull up a chair, adjust your volumes just right, and welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunting, brought to you by ElkBros.com, with your host, Gilbert Ornelas, and elk hunting coach, Joe Gilly. You want to hunt elk? And they live to hunt elk. Their goal is to share with you what they have learned grinding it out for over 35 seasons, doing what they love. So come on into camp and set a spell. Welcome to Blue Collar Elk Hunters. Hello there, everyone. If it's your first time with us, glad to have you. Hope you enjoy the show. And as always, for those blue collar hunters following our show and grinding it out with us every week, welcome back to Elk Camp. I'm Gilbert Ornelas, the host of your show, coming to you from Spring, Texas, and from Burnett, Texas. That's right, your elk hunting coach, the Flatlander himself, Mr. Cole Wilkes, is in the house. <laughs> and from Cimarron, New Mexico, we've got the ninja, Leroy Chavez, and WWJGD, what would Joe Gillia do, is in the house. And joining us for the show tonight, all the way from Callens, Virginia, let's give a warm welcome to today's guest, Mr. Robert Knuckles. Robert! Hey, Robert. Guys. <laughs> Hello, fellas. Hey, how, how are you doing, buddy? Doing great. How about y'all? Real good, man. Good. Now, good to be seen. Yeah. <laughs> Robert, every, you know, the guys jumped on and they were like, how do you know Robert, man? And uh, and like I said, but um, you owe me money. We're going to talk seriously about that here in a little bit. Uh, say, you know. <laughs> right. We'll, we'll, we'll work out. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for everybody else out here listening that doesn't know Robert Knuckles, uh, Bud, can you can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about your elk hunting journey too. Um, well, I grew up in uh, Southern Virginia, a little town here called Callan, so just a little ways off the North Carolina border. Um, just a little farming community. Grew up on a farm, tobacco farm, uh, cattle farm, raised some grain. Uh, Grew up chasing my father and my brother in the in the woods in the water every chance we get. Uh, hunted pretty much everything: deer, turkey, quail, um, you name it. And uh, but turkey hunting certainly uh, became my passion. Um, the whole calling aspect, the interaction with the animals was the whole piece of that. Um, I think it was like 1990. My dad went elk hunting the first time. Went on a rifle hunt come home with a set of horns and um and the stories and uh from the west and i knew i had to do it and uh i think 1992 was my first trip we went on a semi-guided hunt i think it was about 12 of us i think we killed two critters out of the whole bunch you know we went out there we were going we were going to fill up four trucks and bring all the meat back. <laughs> and Somebody we, forgot we both, to tell them there's only 10% yeah. of y'all that will happen for hey, I, I, yeah. I, I, I like it's, the optimism, it's called, man. It's, it's called a humble pie, right? So we're going to eat a whole lot Tag of Tag soup. But anyway, absolutely. But anyway, uh, love the West. Uh, Semi-guided was, uh, you know, hey, we, we, had a, we slept on a school bus. But, you know, those stories, you just can't, you know, you just keep on. But anyway. Uh, they we basically hunted public land, and uh, I said we can do this on our own. So what state were you in? We was in Colorado then. Okay. Um, and then uh, went back in '94, um, killed my first bull then uh, on my own by myself. Had to break down a bull. Yeah, I was interested. <laughs> we'll, get, we'll get to that. Oh, there yeah. ain't no turkey. I can promise you that. We'll get to that uh -huh. later. But uh, <laughs> it was actually a bull. Turkey. It was it was a bull on the oh, back there behind oh, me. There he is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
Um, but anyway, uh, not a monster, but it was a big bull for us at that time. Hey, but anyway, I, I, all of them are big bulls. Yeah. And, uh, so we, we were kind of hunting a, a migratory route, needed snow, uh, was going about every other year and kind of following the snow, if the snow hit, we would go. So is this Had rifle or me. archery? Robert? Yeah, this is all rifle. This is all rifle. Okay. Uh huh. Um, and then I think it was 2005. I had a buddy of mine call me and he said, look, when are you going to lay down that gun and go elk hunting with us? <laughs> I said, so I said, let's do it. So 2006 was my first elk trip. I'd kill like four or five with the rifle, uh, four, I think four with the rifle at that point. But anyway, started in 2006. Um, we killed two bulls, four of us. We killed two bulls in the first, first time we went and hooked is a hook yeah. line and sinker. Yeah. I was, uh, May 12th, I think I've been 12 times since then, since 2006, um, you know, had some different trips involved in there that, that we did miss, but uh, we've been very fortunate in 12 trips. We killed 20 bulls, all wow. three bulls out of oh, the group. So, um, How many guys? So four? Four, four guys. Yeah. No, I hadn't been the same four. Um, me and my running buddy that we started turkey hunting together, uh, We've been fortunate enough to kill 16 of them. So, yeah, I think I've been involved in 17 of those archery bulls calling, or, or I think I've been, I know I've been involved in all of them packing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, so that's, you know, that's I, awesome. I, I, well, we've been we've been very lucky, but we work at it. We work hard, and uh, it's hard work. Uh, absolutely. So, uh, anyway, it's been a journey. I I I I, I still glad that turkey hunting's in the spring and elk hunting's in the fall um because yeah. <laughs> i get to still get to do both and uh so we just had youth day here saturday and uh had a seven-year-old we had three gobbers 12 yards from him <laughs> I, just, I don't he shot right over top of him i think he never got down with a shotgun but that's good stuff to me i love yeah. i love to just to, to get somebody to help them get the first turkey or you bet. Just calling them in for them. That's good stuff. So, so but anyway. I, I, I got a letter from you, and, you know, you just sent this letter off to the Elk Bros, uh, and you went on our site, I guess, and got our address and stuff like that. So you, you listen to the show, I guess? I do. I do. Yeah. Absolutely. Good, good stuff. I listen to a lot Appreciate of different, different podcasts. Any way that I can help better myself is, as an elk hunter is any nugget that I can pick up you know i'm gonna i'm gonna listen to it when i first started it wasn't it was you didn't have these things you know <laughs> yeah uh, no doubt it's uh it's a really plus and i you know i anytime somebody's asking is is that's one of the first places i'm gonna send them is y'all's podcast some of the other ones to to yeah, that's listen I, I wanted people to know man is that this show tonight um just like a lot of our shows actually are born from letters or comments or conversations with our listeners out there you know and it's it's so cool when we get a letter i get a letter from robert and he he starts talking about his passion for turkey hunting how he thought that was his whole world until he saw and started hunting elk and he said that kind of changed things but he you know and he started talking about that turkey comparison the things that helped him and the things that hurt him and and you know when when i got that letter i was like i, I responded to him i was like buddy man this is this is great stuff for a conversation because these are the actual things that people need to hear people need to understand and people need to also know that and there's a lot of ways that they are no nothing alike but there's things that you can absolutely take from it and and i think that's important for our guys especially you know anybody that's going east of these rocky mountain states out here that they are actually if they are turkey hunting they are developing a skill set but there's things there that can hurt them there's things that can help them and there's things that they just got to listen to us and get ready for man because it ain't you know, absolutely yeah right. joe i've got a friend of mine chad russell who's i mean he's from mississippi and chad is the most devout turkey hunter i've ever met in my life i mean he's got thousands of dollars worth of turkey calls and you name it man the best <laughs> gear and and you know he hunts on our ranch with us down in south texas and man our ranch is you know, we got lots of turkeys but we don't have tons of gobblers and right 
he's, you know, that guy can call turkeys like you can call bull elk, right? I mean, he's amazing turkey calls. And I told him, I said, you know, he's never killed a bull. And uh, I told him, I said, Chad, I'm going to tell you right now, I know how much you love turkey hunting and I do too. But the first time I call a bull in for you, it will change your life. Like turkey hunting and elk hunting are different, but they're a lot the same, but they're different, you know? And he's like, well, I'm worried about that because it's a hell of a lot more money, to, you know, to hunt elk. He's got all kinds of passions that are expensive, but uh, Chad's a, an unbelievable turkey caller. And I mean, dude's got turkey tracks tattooed down his calves and on his back. <laughs> turkey he's got tattooed. I mean, the dude is serious about turkey hunting, you know, and, and uh, I love guys like that that have tons of passion. Yeah, absolutely. Love to hunt turkeys. And, and now they're crossing over into our elk woods. And like you said, Mr. Knuckles is it's 100% the interaction with the animal, you know, Cole loves deer hunt too. And he loves calling men rattling and, and stuff blowing a grunt too, just like we do too. We, we love doing that. There's a time and a place for that in Texas and all over the country. And man, when you can interact with animals and be able to call them and get them in tight, those are the things that we just absolutely love to do. The first Ducks, time I ever went pig hunting on Gilbert's place, I was yeah calling in the pigs so yeah oh yeah. really yeah, oh, yeah. using a little grunt and stuff like that yeah, yeah right. i actually grunted a pig this year we was i was hunting with joe a few weeks ago up at uh up in oklahoma with Luis and them and i actually grunted a pig and stopped him you know because right. they're, they're pretty vocal animals themselves yeah, and you absolutely. Grunt them or stuff, they're like hey man that's another hog over there so we uh we got him to stop, but he didn't cooperate. Uh, <laughs> we had some limbs in the way and these things. Uh, but at the end of the day, man, that's what we love to do is hunt critters like that. Yep. It's and, like, and I think people are gonna get great nuggets out of this one. I think it's gonna put a lot of light bulbs on. You know, uh Cole has a lot to bring with that. Gilbert has a lot to bring. You know, Chab and I, man, we used to love to hunt mule deer until we started you know hunting elk and then that changed that whole world you know it was like well if we see a deer we'll shoot one but you know <laughs> we, here in new mexico they're the same season so it, the choice had you know had right. to go one way or the other but robert, so, what, robert what do you do for a living brother i work for duke energy so i work for power company uh, okay. i work in the in the power plants uh maintenance work uh, travel all over the carolinas for them oh cool is that Duke, Duke is like their energy source out there? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, gotcha. it's uh, Carolinas. They, we've got some stuff in the Midwest. And actually, got some stuff all, all the way across the country, really. But um, it's uh, keeps me busy. Been putting food on the table for well, thirty-two years now. So that's awesome, brother. Been a long time. Wow. Yeah. All right, man. It's going to be a great conversation here, Joe. Before we move on, how about you head on over to our Elk Bros mailbox? and start us off brother yeah you bet you man and and these are two great questions that i'm really interested to hear what everybody has to say on this first of all aaron bagwa fostoria michigan he says a second year hunter who is starting to think more clearly <laughs> i like that start to think more clearly and not just expecting to muscle through everything in other words he's not doing the wilkes plan you know, he's not doing that one. <laughs> it, it is big country. When solo hunting is there, oh, when solo hunting, is there a preferred sequence for hauling quarters out? Is it better to haul the heavier hind quarters first, knowing that as you get tired, the haul will get easier? <laughs> Let me tell you something. When you got the four-wheel drive, Cole Wilkes in your camp, it don't mean a damn thing whether you haul it first, <laughs> second, or last. He just says, you put it on me and let me go, big boy. When you got when you got a man that can haul meat like that, it's all good in the hood. I promise you. Yeah. When you got, yeah, when you have somebody that can hold a hind quarter straight out like that. Yeah. Look, I mean, wow. <laughs> oh Wilkes is an absolute bad. listen. That's... I got to witness it. Yeah. He, you know. He is just an absolute animal. And Rob Canales, those guys, you know, we talked a little bit about it before we got on, Robert. These guys, you ride the river with them, and 
you know, you, you can't do some of the stuff when you shoot elk in places that we go to without having help, you know, uh, and I couldn't have never, I, I couldn't have never got my bull out of where it was if it wasn't for Joe, the mafia and Mr. Wilkes here and, and Rob Canales. I mean, these guys stopped what they were doing and made a long trek up the mountain to where we were and helped haul, haul meat down for me. And it's a, it's a different deal when you're solo, man, because yeah, but you, know, you gotta I, make a plan. I can remember when I, when I first killed my first elk out there in the woods, I was, I mean, I've been several solo on several occasions. And, uh, in fact, you know, when I started hunting elk back in the eighties and taking elk, then, you know, when I grew up in the Carolinas, we always hauled our deer a whole, well, they're always the size of a daggum dog out there. Right. So, I mean, right. gut it, throw it over and you haul it out, but now you get there and you've just killed this thing. And, and look, when you walk up on it, that's when I you start God, realizing <laughs> what have I done now? It's on, Absolutely. man. What the heck have I done? And, and what was interesting about that was, I think it was probably three, I was three or four elk in when I started mm -hmm. realizing, I was like, you know, why am I taking all this critter out? Because when I get it there and I start doing everything, I'm leaving a lot of critter. I'm leaving a lot of bone. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm that I'm hauling for nothing. So I actually started going from the outside in doing this, taking quarters and then taking the meat off the neck and taking off the spine, just deboning the animal, basically using a gutless method before a gutless method was ever called a gutless method. Man. It was just, I, I didn't understand going in gutting an animal if I didn't have to, you know, so I started doing it then, but let me tell you what, man, um, you know, when you start hauling stuff out, luckily I've never been really that far um, from a vehicle. I would say there, you know, most of the time because of the areas that I'd, you know, that I hunted in, I could get a vehicle within anywhere from a mile to a half mile. Right. And a lot of elk that we've been able to get within, you know, two tents, three tents, stuff like that. But lucky. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> thinking the same thing. That is lucky. <laughs> well, that, that's not luck cold. That's called planning, man. That's called I planning, man. <laughs> well, it wasn't the case this year. We're pretty good ways from well, and then once I started hunting, with shitty, groups, shitty walking. <laughs> you know, when, when you hunt in a pack, yeah, when yeah. you hunt in a pack, that yeah. changes the dynamic of how far and where you can hunt. Yeah, because absolutely. Now you can go in with a pack of guys and you can take an animal out in one haul, man. And, you know, if anything, it's two trips where you're just going back to get equipment and stuff like that. It's not, it's not brutal. Like, and so I'm going to rest my mouth right now because I know that there's one of us here that's had to do this solo for some distance. And, and uh, so Cole, I, I talked about how smart I was. So let me hear, let me hear your version, man. <laughs> yeah, how do you do it when you're that far in Cole? Aaron, here's what I would tell you. Okay. I've done it both ways. Right. I've carried out, I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to come back into this hell hole that I've dropped this bull in uh, because I'm too stubborn to turn away from a bugle, right? So now I've got this bull on the ground. There's two ways that you can do it. You can start shuffling the meat and take out one quarter at a time. And then all of your neck meat and back strap and all that stuff, you're looking at, you know, depending on how you're going to really bear down and carry that stuff what i would say is regardless of how you do it i think it all works out to about the same amount of time <laughs> so whenever i have a half a bull on my back and whenever i say a half a bull i've got a hind quarter and a shoulder and then a back strap and a tenderloin that's one half of my bull <laughs> i told He's you man. Robert. i He's told you you ain't you seen said he was a Dude, you said he would. Hey, I've done, he's, he's, done this okay. on on all of the elk that I've killed, or Kyle has killed. This is the way we've done it. And then with these guys, they go out, you know, and and they have a pack. But if you're by yourself, you're gonna have to think about it, right? You don't want to. You don't want to hurt yourself. That's the most important thing. And the next thing is is even if you load down with an entire half a bull on your back. It took me and Kyle to get my bull out like four years ago. It was, 
six, it was only six and a half miles and we loaded down with half of the bull and it took us nine hours to get him out. Oh. Mm. And you, yeah. can you bring bone out? Cole? Well, on that you, trip, no, we boned everything out. I've only okay, brought, yeah. I killed a small bull, not last year, but the year before. And uh, I already had him packaged up whenever Kyle got there and, and we packed all the bones out because I wanted uh, to make bone broth. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I brought bone out one time and I don't think I'll do it again. It just, it's like you, like, kind of like, like Joe said, you get out, you're going to throw it away anyway. Why, may, why do that? It really does. Yeah. But I, just, you know, you're going to know what you're going to be able to handle and just don't get yourself into a dumb situation and hauling too much meat because. I mean, realistically, if you're in the right conditions, that meat can can hang there for days and, and you already have the allotted time and, and you don't have to rush. Then I say, you know, take it out one quarter at a time. Don't overdo it. Make it easier on yourself. Enjoy the woods. You know, just treat it as a hike. If it's if it's something to where you're pressed for time and it's hot, then obviously I would say load yourself down with as much as what you can handle or call for help. and if, if if you're in a situation where you have camp on your back and let's say you're in a hole like what cole was talking about you know it's even feasible to go get out of the hole get all the meat out of the hole however many trips you know what cole's talking about by putting a half of an animal on your back um you have That's better be a, a wilk so you're asking to get hurt man i mean for sure yeah, and, and Cole, do you carry you carry trekking poles too with you, don't you? I do. Yeah, yeah I, those are big things to have. So when you're trekking downhill, you can you know keep right. your balance and those things, man. So you, if you, you if you know you're going, Aaron, if you know you're going to be in a really bad spot, plan for that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know, well, bring me some trekking poles. And like a lot of times, what we do is, you know, depending on where we're at we devise a plan on how to get back to the truck, right? The safest way that we're going to get back to the truck. Most of the time it's going to contour. Mm -hmm. We're going to follow our contour lines. So we're not doing a whole bunch of up and down. Yeah. And so we <laughs> will show the meat either from where we kill the bull up to that contour line. And most of the times we'll take them one quarter at a time and get it up to elevation or down to elevation. And then we load the whole bull on or whatever the case is, cow, whatever, <clears throat> and then we take our time and we i would never do that if i didn't have truck and falls i'm gonna be honest because i'm able to put my arms down if i'm going downhill i'm able to stabilize everything and then take a step and take a step rather than in if you're trying to just muscle it with your legs y'all that 150 pounds i mean you're gonna you're gonna mess up a knee real quick yeah, and, and, and listen to what he's saying. If that animal's deboned and you've gotten rid of that bone, that's a whole lot more feasible, you know, when you're doing a shoulder and you're doing a, you know, a hind quarter, yeah. uh, you know, that's a Still whole lot a more feasible bone. than trying yeah. to carry that bone. There is a lot of weight. And I'm going to yeah. tell you something that, uh, you know, if you can, if you've got, if you're just solo, like you're saying in this, that's a different deal. So, you know, if you can get up to elevation to where, let's say that, if you're in that six mile and you can get to a point where you're up, you get above it, however short, however long, and you can camp there. So you're shuttling back and forth and get you some rest. And then you get out the next day early heading on the down part. If you can break that up with a plan, that's a whole lot better. But if you do debone that meat, you've got to make sure when you get there that you have it. So it's, in small enough bags or broken up enough or hung enough where it's not heat that's, you know, staying entrapped in that meat. That's one thing about when you debone and you start sacking stuff up, you know, if you're going to keep that heat and, uh, and depends on what type, you know, what time of year it is and those types of things. But, but when you were asking about weight, if you do, if you do plan on doing something, yes, it's always easier to take something out lighter the third time than it is, you know, something heavier. And, For sure. and your head is the last thing, man. Um, you know, and if sometimes you can even leave some gear, but if you end up doing that, let's say you end up leaving your boat, do not leave your bow on the animal, leave it on the trail, 
going to the animal so that you have I'm a weapon intrigued. when you're approaching it. Yes. Yeah. And in case somebody else stumbles across that as well, mm -hmm. you know, so just take care of your weapon in that way. So these are just little things that you think about. And the other thing is too, is I actually had to leave my animal and go up and find some guys one time to come and get me. And one thing I did was I, you know, I urinated a circle all the way around that thing just to, you know, let the animals know that there was a human in the area to try to help me out and nothing ended up getting on it. So I got pretty fortunate about that. So that's just one of and my I, I, redneck trip. Yeah. And I think too, Joe, if you know, you're going in by yourself, it's probably a good idea to check around that area. If there are services there to help you pack your bull out, you yes. know, especially if you know, when you go on, on a, on a back, back country hunt, you know, yeah. Uh, somebody there are services around there pack out services most of these uh towns in colorado uh idaho they got people that do that for a living they come help you pack your bull out robert have I, you had to pack I, one out I, solo um i most of the time if i've ever killed solo it was head back to the truck and call in some some help you know <laughs> um but what call, i thought call i mean Wilkes. you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> What I thought about on this question is um, one thing that's been a game changer for us, it, and, and I'm ashamed to say it took us that long to really realize it, but we had these Cabela's external frame packs that they worked great, but but I didn't hunt in it. So that was either at a – maybe we, we camped in, my pack was at the camp, you kill a bull, well – I had a fanny pack, you know, I was hunting with the fanny pack. So I would come out with, you know, back straps over my shoulder, tied around my neck, whatever I would do. But basically that was a wasted trip. The new packs out there today are game changers. I mean, where you can hunt comfortably with a nice pack on your back that you can put a quarter or, or more on it. So that first trip you come out, you bring in a heavy load. That's a game changer. I mean, it's a, it's a game. We went from, so, you know, we hunt pairs now just because um, we're smarter. And that's what I would, that would be my, <laughs> my babe suggestion is better get, get you a friend to hunt with you. Um, but, you know, that's one thing that's changed for us. It's just, it saves a trip. You know, you don't, you can, you can haul out a, a good load there. And two guys, if you're hunting together and you carry out a heavy load, you know, you can go back with one more trip. Yeah. And you don't have to bring half a bull like Cole can handle. Sure. You know, us old men can't handle that. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> and I think Cole found out hunting with us this year that it is fun to have a couple guys with you. You know, well, he's, yeah, he's been hunting so much solo <laughs> and him and his other bud, but you know, they branch off and go kind of do their own things right. and everything. But having a couple guys with you, man, that's it's just uh it's fun to watch, fun to be a part of and fun to call and get in the scenarios and stuff. And then when yeah. you do knock something down, man, you got some credible help with you, you know, That's right. so you all, I, I don't care what I'm doing. If I'm whitetail hunting on public land, if I'm elk hunting back country, I don't ever go out that morning with, I intend on carrying meat back to camp or the truck every single day. That's what we're out there to do. Right. right. So make sure. That's smart prepared for that at all times whether absolutely a heavy load or that's preparing your meat or that's making sure that it's taken care of 100 percent whenever you make that harvest right. because every day that i leave the truck or, or camp or anything i am on hauling meat back that's my goal every yeah. single right. day and we, we keep our, you know, we hunt mobile most of the time. We hunt off of the UTV and then, you know, we'll go four or five miles where we got to go come back to the UTV. And a lot of times we'll have our big packs on that UTV. So when we come back, we can go get it. But I tell you this, this year is the first year we killed something pretty well off the, for me, we killed it off the, the beaten path pretty good ways. It was not going to be conducive to go get a pack and go up there. We're going to need to haul stuff in our packs and, you know, um, not that we're sponsored by Badlands or anything like that, but uh, I've got a Diablo dose that I pretty much took everything out of that pack. And I keep I, in my pack, I keep a uh, cheesecloth with me. So when we do knock something down, we can at least get it in something that'll keep it clean and cool. And we hang it up while we're quartering everything. So it'll start cooling the cool down process. And we do, we debone everything and we started shoving stuff in our backpacks, you know, and uh, that first trip down, man, we, 
you know, I think I had all the back strap, neck meat and everything shoved in that one pack. And uh, we weren't coming back without having going down there to go get those frame packs without having something. And Joe and them actually found the bike, came up with the frame packs and from below, but it's, you got, like Cole said, 100%, you got to be prepared for success. That's what you're going to do. Uh, absolutely. You know, so you better have the stuff with you to make it happen. Otherwise, you know, you're going to be with, meat that you've harvested that you can't get back and ain't nobody want to take a loaf of bread and eat him on the mountain yeah. i mean at the end of the day you've got to <laughs> plan for success and get him back there and get him cooled down and man enjoy the unbelievable you know meat that you you've uh, taken i'll you tell know, you harvest. one last thing too is man make sure the areas that you're hunting study 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 so you know every trail and road system in there because yeah. you know i've seen guys haul meat out six miles when they could have you know, driven on a, on a forest road and got within two miles. So uh -huh. you know, uh, that kind of stuff helps you. If you just really, you know, study your area, make sure you scout it well. And, and knowing your road system and your trail system is critical wherever you're at. And the regulations in the state that you're hunting, whether you can Absolutely. get off of those roads or not, yeah. you know. Right. So Chad, you want to take the next one? That was a great question, man. Thanks, Aaron. Good. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, the next question comes from Kyle Simmons from Denver, Colorado. He says, hey, bros, I was hoping you could help me with an issue. I have some friends that I took elk hunting for the first time in one of my, in one of my honey holes this last archery season. They are both good guys, but this year they were telling some of their other friends to put in for my unit and even giving away locations. When I told them what they did wasn't cool. They thought I was being an a-hole. Am I wrong? How would you handle this? <laughs> Who wants There's to a code. First? There's a code amongst hunters, man. Uh, and I'm gonna, yeah. let, I'm gonna let Cole start it off, and then I'll, I'll bring my, my stuff in the rear because I'm pretty yeah. passionate about that as well. That, that that's the deal. Like Kyle and I have this agreement. Like I have spots. Kyle has spots. Us elk bros have spots now. And, and it's kind of an agreement. Like you don't go, you don't go, I, this is just our agreement, right? I, I say try to help guys out as much as you can, as far as e-scouting and, and trying to provide their own area. But I knew I would never just go drop in a, a name of a spot or any of that without uh, either that person being with me that took me to that spot or me getting confirmation from that person that it's cool if I let friends go there, right? Because some of these guys, like some of these guys have been hunting these spots for 10, 20, you know, 30 years. And, and then you go tell a, a bunch of ding dings that haven't ever <laughs> been out there before and they go ruin that area that have has been so productive for people before without knowing what they're doing it could really turn it a good spot bad and we've all seen this right yeah we've all had those guys oh no doubt it is a code i think no amongst all of us hunters like it's all of yeah. our spot right it's all of yeah. our spot but yeah. Some of us have to do the work to earn those spots. And if That's you good. don't have a conversation, work, then you don't deserve the spot. Like yeah. I'll give you a 500 mile radius, but I'm not going to give you my spot. <laughs> right. That's, yeah, I, I, that's I agree I, with you a, a million fold Cole. I, I spent a lot of time bass fishing professionally and, and, uh, you know, I, if I ever put a guy in a boat with me that was just going to come leisure fishing or whatever that I knew was going to be fishing against me, before we ever left the dock, it was, it was talked about, hey, we're headed to sacred ground. You ain't never <laughs> been here before. And I better never see you there without me. You know, Honor. and it, if that can't happen, we're going to go to your fish today because I'm not, <laughs> you're not going to mine. Right. So and it's, you got to have that conversation. Hey fellas, I'm taking you to a place that's, you know, that was the guy that showed me he's dead. So it's kind of my place. I've been hunting here for 15, 20 years. It'd be like me taking someone, somebody to Joe's spot without Joe being with me or me asking permission, Joe, can I go over there and hunt? Or are you going to be over there hunting? But I, I could never go tell my other two buddies, Hey, y'all need to go sit in this, go hunt old Joe's spot over here. No, that wouldn't fly. Joe, Joe cut me off like that for giving 
that kind of information out. Right. But that has to happen when you start hunting with guys, you have to have those conversations up front. It's about managing expectations and having clear lines of communication. And listen, there are just some guys out there cold and don't matter. They got to go see what they ain't got. Right. They got to go to where, you know, they think the, you know, you holding out, I could tell guys all the time what I was doing, where I was catching them and they wouldn't believe me. Oh, you ain't telling me you're telling me a lie. I'm like, okay, look, that's not, that's me. Not me. I will not tell you a lie. I will tell you, I don't want to tell you, or I'm not going to tell you, but I ain't going to tell you a lie just to go send you on some wild goose chase. Yeah. But for you, for those guys to go and invite your places you showed them to hunt to other people is wrong. And I don't know how else to say it. That goes against the bro code or hunt code. You just can't do that. You know, it's disrespectful, but, man. Disrespectful. Yeah, and you got you got to have that conversation with them. If they think you're buttholes, time to part ways with that crew, bud. Find you a new crew. Real quick story couple of years ago my cousin reached out to me and he was like hey man i really want to come elk hunting with you and uh i want to bring my two buddies and i was like all right well i talked to kyle and they knew that we had been successful obviously and and that's why they wanted to come with us right oh. so i talked to kyle and he was like here's the deal you have to take them here first and you have to put them through this this grueling hike and all of this <laughs> and he was they like they gotta pay their ride of passage yes dude <laughs> and he they make it through that then you can take them to the spot right right and so i did dude and even whenever we got done and i was like okay now are y'all ready to go elk hunting they're like we knew you were gonna make us go through some crap before you just took us to the good spot and i was like look <laughs> the good spot is <laughs> It took me forever to be able to get Kyle to take me to a good spot, right? Or what I consider to be a good spot. And and it was just, you know, that's how we had to break you in. You had to, you know, we had to let the mountain beat you up a little bit before you went to this spot. Or you had to earn it, you know? It's not something that we just give to anybody. And they have to. And not only earn it, but figure it out, man. You know, yeah. it, it should not be me having to you know, sugar feed you, man. I mean, if you're going to be an elk hunter, then take an active part in what we're doing. Let me see you try to figure it out. I've actually, I have one. So <laughs> I have some places here in Northern New Mexico. I know really, really well that uh, I know how to hunt them. I know where the spots are. I know how the elk move. And I received a letter from one of our listeners and he's like, Joey says, I'm not asking you anything. I just want to tell you, I've been looking at this one spot and here's some of my thoughts on it. And I started reading this. This is somebody that's from four States away, man. And well, and they're like this spot here, I'm thinking this blah, blah, blah. And then over here, this was interesting because of blah, blah. I mean, nailed four locations that I'm like, Oh my God, is this person in my head? Or what? <laughs> and, you know, and, and I didn't, I didn't go like, you know, go there, this, that. I'm like, man, you got it. Yeah, I mean, you're good. It out. I ain't got yeah. it. Yeah, go get Knock after it. Out, brother. Yeah. Uh, and and I was really, I was really happy for that person that they did the work, they did the research, they figured it out. You know, they fed themselves, man. It's not like I own the country, but. You know, for me to help somebody else after I've been hunting a place for 20 daggum years, figuring out how those animals move through there, where they're going to be, if they're not here, where they're going to be on BC, you know, in those places, do I just give that up to somebody that hasn't earned it? You know, well, uh, unless they're paying some money in, in my pocket because yeah. I'm guiding them, you know, yeah. there, there's a lot to be said for knowledge, right? Knowledge means money, right? Yeah. So, I tell people all the time, you can't, yeah. people say, Hey, I, I, you know, you charge a hundred dollars an hour to, to teach my kids hitting lessons. And I'm like, no, it's $50 for 30 minutes. They're like, yeah, but that's a hundred dollars an hour. I said, <laughs> but you don't understand. You're not paying me for the $50 for the 30 minutes. You're paying me for the 35 years it took for me to learn how to Absolutely. teach your kid how to hit that you couldn't do all your life. 
<laughs> what you're paying me for. Yeah. You know, absolutely. you're not paying me for the for the time, man. You're paying me for all the experience that I had to put in to learn how to teach your child how to hit a baseball or how to hit a softball. Absolutely. It's the same thing Joe's talking about. He's absolutely. put the time on the mountain in. He's gone up and down those mountains for 20 years, and you just want it gifted to you, and then you want to bring others in that? No, man. That yeah. dog don't hunt. No, Kyle, not Kyle, around our elk crew. You're not being a butthole, Kyle. You are are you man You're holding and, the code yeah you, you are being disrespected and that's mm-hmm. all you have to do and and it doesn't have to be a big deal man it's not like mm. it's not like you know uh you know somebody <laughs> mad dogging somebody because they they've t- it's like look y'all you know i did this out of the goodness of my heart and this is how you're getting treating me back that's disrespectful you know and what about the person that showed it to me after they've been hunting it for 20 years you know right. they they gave me a gift <clears throat> and i shared it with you in confidence and now you're just giving it out so and but i do like you said though gilbert you got to manage those expectations you got to have those conversations up up front front. and you got to tell them it's like look man we're going to go hunt an area that was showed to me by somebody that you know knows this place very very well and spent years in here you know you are not going to come back in here without me you know or if you are let's know this right now because we're not going there you know, I'm not going to disrespect the people that that were kind enough to do that for me. So, Kyle, Kyle I'll tell you this real quick. The mafia this year found an area to hunt <laughs> up on a mountain. OK, and they left it. They told me we're not hunting there today. We're going to go and check off, try to find some new country. And I said, well, y'all found elk up there? And they're like, yeah. I said, well, it don't take it. You ain't got to hit me in the face with a shitty mop for me to know there's elk up there. So I said, let me ask you something, boys. Y'all found that that area. Is it okay if me and RC go up there and hunt and, today? And that's I asked our them that. group that you did that, man. This and, is and, our and, hunting group. Yeah, I <laughs> asked them because they found that area and they actually, I think my nano harvested a cow out of there. And he, they, he said, yes, he said, and look, I, I actually shot the bull Luis drew on and didn't get it done. Right. So, and Luis shot a bull that Joe told him about an area where the bull was, but we all communicate with one another. And, and I would have never gone there had the mafia said, no, we'd really like you to stay out of there. That's going to be our evening spot or whatever, man. But we all have to ask and, and, you know, we don't give out areas we hunt either. We don't tell people what units we're putting in for because I'm not, I got to draw against you. Why would I want to go do something like that? You know, um, it's just all part about communication and, and holding that line of communication open and respect for you, for you guys you're hunting with, man. And you dude, have you respect, can't respect that, yeah. you, you need to move on, man. If they exactly. can't and look, if, if anybody's opinions differ from us, that's great. But we're giving our own opinions here. We're not saying everybody's got to be like this, but yeah. this is the way we hunt. If your buddy disagrees with you, just tell him to come listen to what we said. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Tell him it, it's, it's, we- it's, that's right, because Cole Wilkes says so. <laughs> <laughs> like Stone Cold, you hear me? <laughs> All right, man. Guys, you know what time it is. It's oh, time for the Elk oh, Bro oh, shout out. Oh, if oh, you're new to our show, let's just shout out to a few cities with the most listeners topping our charts this week, Joe. Hey, Robert's going to start this out, man. Robert, we're going to let you give a shout out there, bud. All right, we'll talk about my big bump in the road. So uh, I, my farming community is located in Southern Virginia, um, not too far from the North Carolina border. Um, we're near Danville, Virginia, uh, not about 30 minutes from Martinsville Speedway, um, about 15 minutes from Smith Mountain Lake. I don't know if oh, you are yeah. not that way or not. Yeah. Okay. But anyway, it's a couple of stop signs. We're about 30, so we're about 30 minutes from the nearest Walmart kind of like it that way yeah and uh yeah. but this uh my hometown's callens virginia yeah. callens, virginia. Cool. Cool. Hey, All right. and and i'm an hour and 15 minutes hour and 15 minutes from a walmart man yeah oh, that's good <laughs> where i live right here all right chav start us out bro okay this city has long considered the geographic center of north america even though it's not quite scientifically accurate a 15-foot rock obelisk marks the unofficial center of North America and is surrounded by Canadian, Mexican, and American flags. It was founded in 1885 
as a Great Northern Railroad Junction and named after a town in Great Britain. The area was first settled by Scandinavian and German immigrants. And this is in Rugby, North Dakota. Yeah. Rugby, North Dakota. I, I love rugby, man. That's awesome, man. That sounds like yeah. a tough town. I've never heard of that town, Joe. And I've what? been all over North Dakota. So. A North Dakota That's town cool. you haven't heard of yet? <laughs> I know, man. I've never heard of rugby. That's awesome. And and it's it's the unofficial center of North America, man. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know all about that, but if that's where rugby's at, I'm gonna have to check it out, man, because we've worked tons and tons up North Dakota. Hey, I'm I'm just glad to have those North Dakota people listen, man. Thank you guys. Absolutely. Thank y'all very much. Joe, this next top listening city is located in Caldwell Parish. Oh, Parish. That's gotta be Louisiana. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and population. Just under 600 citizens. If you like hiking, some of the best trails around are found near this town. Among the popular trails are the Wild Azalea Trails and uh, Lake Chico's Loop Trail, uh, Fountain Fountain Hillu, I guess. That would, I think that's Fountain Hillu. Yeah, Fount, Fountain Baloo State Park and the Buckbone Trail. Oh, and uh, That's the Kitsachi. backbone, man. I thought you said buttbone for a second. No, I said Backbone <laughs> Trail in the Kitsachi National Forest. Former Louisiana Governor John J. Uh, McKechen, looks like that might be McKechen. McKeithen. 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 McKeithen was born here in Grayson, Louisiana, almost in the middle of the state, just a little east, south of Columbia, it's almost in the middle of the state there. You've uh, been through there? I have been been through there on my way from Gina up north, uh, headed towards some oil fields and stuff he, like he that. He didn't go through there heading to Rugby, North Dakota. We know no, that. Any, that was any, the wrong any, way. Are there any stoplights there in Grayson? It seemed like a mm, small town. I, I think so, yeah. It's a pretty small town there, but I think there's one in the middle of town there for sure. Grayson, man, glad to have you on the map here. Always good to have our Kunas brothers from the east, Joe. <laughs> This city, a part of the Waco metropolitan area, was established by Civil War veteran Burl Kendrick in 1865. The 15-acre Carlene Bright Arboretum is a must-stop and see for visitors. Ar Arbor How do you say that? Arboretum? Arboretum. Arboretum? Mm -hmm. Arboretum contains six acres. So I, I'm just going to say it's a big place with plants in it right, right. <laughs> sure is. it contains six acres of beautiful lush gardens an amphitheater with a covered gazebo and a small chapel cardinals the city's official bird can be seen in abundant numbers in this beautiful place of trees and plants in <laughs> woodway texas man Woodway, Woodway Texas, Texas in the house. Give you some crap right now, bro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, uh, I, I was going to say arboratorium or Ab I think that's right. <laughs> Arboretum. Yeah. But let me tell you what, talk about cardinals. You know, I, you know, I'm from Virginia where the state bird's a cardinal, right? Mm -hmm. And I thought I had seen Cardinals before, but when I was sitting in the blind in Oklahoma, right across the Texas border there, was the <laughs> most incredible amount of beautiful Cardinals I've ever seen in my life, man. They were just everywhere and just, you know, all this red, it was gorgeous, man, to see that. It was just, uh, what a beautiful bird. And in that kind of numbers, it was really special. Yeah, they do like some corn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they do. Well, they pack it away for sure. Yeah. Located at the foot of the Blue Ridge Plateau, this town is rich in history and one of Virginia's hidden gems. The town was originally named Taylorsville, but was later changed to honor their local Civil War hero, General James Stewart. The city hosts a popular wine and food festival uh, annual annually in May, as well as the annual Strawberry Festival coming up here in May. Uh, that takes over the city's streets with uh, folks coming from miles for the fun to eat in the incredible fruit uh, by the bucket loads in Stewart, Virginia. Stewart, Virginia. Stewart, Virginia. Yeah. Oh, that ain't cool. about, 40, about 45 minutes from me. Oh, oh really? Kind of crazy, yeah. So as a kid, 
um, my grandma and aunts and, and, and my uh, stepmom, they loved to go strawberry picking. And so they would haul us kids off and you go to these giant strawberry fields and you have all these buckets. And when you're going in, they weigh the buckets, you know, put a, a amount of weight on them. And then you go in, you pick the strawberries. And then as you're coming out, they weigh it and subtract the difference and then have you pay for the strawberries. Well, the only problem with that whole thing, man, is they were weighing the wrong thing. <laughs> they definitely should have been weighing us kids, man. Kids. Kids, man. <laughs> Y'all have ate all of them. Well, we'd sit there for hours while they were picking it. I'm just eating strawberries, dude, just like. Ooh, <laughs> Lord. No tomorrow, man. Y'all was eating all the dead gum product. Yeah, they, they were absolutely weighing the wrong implement. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the, uh, the final top listening city was laid out as a town in 1871 by David Stone and named after Stone's hometown in Illinois. The Edgerton Explorate Center is one of the town's most popular attractions. The center was inspired by Harold Doc Eg Edgerton, the inventor of the strobe light. And the hands-on science center lets kids explore and have fun in a, a unique environment. It was recently named as the best place to raise a family by Progressive Farmer Magazine, and this is in Aurora, Nebraska. Aurora, Nebraska. I said, I can't wait to go back to Nebraska. Yeah, you oh. had some good time there this week, this year, didn't you? Dude, De Nebraska was rough. Really? Hard, hard deer hunting, yeah. Right. I went once in October, and I went back in December, and it was brutal. <laughs> <laughs> it's cold, brother. And, cold. and you can't wait to go back? Yeah, I, dude, I'm not going to go and not go fill a tag. Like, I'm coming back. I'm going to go back and fill a tag. Yeah. Were you hunting on the North Platte River or anything like that? Dude, I was right on the Platte River. I got That's you. where I dumped that, like, 150-inch buck 100 yards from the truck and oh. it blew out in front of me. And, of course, I was just, like, trudging through. I'm like, I'm going hunting, y'all. Right, and, right. <laughs> 150 whitetail, and I was kicking myself all the way through December. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I went like four different states, but I didn't fill my tag in Nebraska, so I kept trying to go back and and get it done. Yeah, I, I remember I remember getting those uh, shots from you, man. Little clips and stuff. Yeah, yeah, stuff. yeah. yeah. It was brutal. All right, man. Uh, we're going to get to our main topic for tonight, and that is elk hunting and turkey hunting similarities, differences, and not even close. And we're going to handle it like that. We're going to talk about. Um, we're going to talk first about those things that the skills that a turkey hunter can take into the woods that will definitely help them. And then we're going to talk about those things that actually hurt turkey hunters in the woods. And then we're, you know, then we're going to get real with the things that it's just absolutely nothing alike, you know, when it comes to elk hunting. So let, let's talk the first part and and, you know, Robert, we have you here, so we're going to let you kind of start off and we're going to feed off of you because you sent this letter in and, well, I'm just going to let you go ahead. You, you were telling me about your passion and you were talking about, then you talked about the things that were basically led you down the wrong path as well. Right. So, um, tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I mean, there, there are a lot of similarities. The, the the vocal interaction locate you know you uh turkey same way locate try to get in as close as you can set up is everything i, I use a i use a i'll never forget it so i was probably i don't know i was probably my 20s i went to a night in hell gave a seminar and i was sitting in there and they was giving a talk about turkey hunting you know night in hell calls y'all know them but anyway I can't remember which one of them said it. And they said, they got up there and stood up and they said, okay, guys, it's three things that you need to, the three most important things about turkey hunting. And they said, everybody was like, okay, well, he said, it's location, location, location. <laughs> That's the three things. And, and that, that is very, very much the case for turkey. You know, it's, it's certainly easier to call a turkey where he wants, you know, to be in the travel route he wants to go. Elk's the same way. Turkeys of uh, like to have that visual. They like to stop. They like to hang up just like an elk does. Um, 
you know, turkey hunting, you use topography, you know, you want to, don't set up on top of the ridge, set up on just over the crest, make, make the turkey come in the range before he has uh, uh, the ability to see what it calls coming from. Um, very, very similar, you know, they'll trigger off of the, certainly it's the breeding cycle for both of the animals when you're hurting, hunting, but they also trigger off the fight aspect of it. I don't know a lot of people that use gobble calls, you know, but um, quite like you do a bugle, but you certainly can, and it certainly will work. You know, um, they'll they'll fight and protect their area just like a elk will. But it's it's, it's a lot of similarities there, as far as far as setup, far as uh, how to approach. Um, maybe a, maybe a little bit different. You certainly want to locate. Certainly, if you can pattern the direction they're going or how what their normal patterns are. Uh, is very helpful you know that's that's a lot of the similarities to it so how how did you apply this stuff yeah i mean you're talking about the similarities but you you're somebody that loved turkey hunt and you got in the elk woods right how did you apply some of those same ideas of course now when we talk about calling did you use diaphragm calls at all yeah yes and how, yes. how long I mean, did it, how long did it take you to get comfortable calling elk because i know your first part of your elk hunting career started out rifle hunting and y'all probably weren't doing a lot of calling at no, the time it was no. more glassing and more yeah. spot and stalk type stuff right started so, out started out open read calls when we started bow hunting yeah i didn't i didn't even have to carry a call rifle hunt we were mm -hmm. hunting late season uh, uh rifle hunting but yeah i started out with open read calls um and just you, you by diaphragm, start start practicing. Uh, about all I use, I mean, I do use uh, slate. Very seldom use a box called turkey hunting. So, of course, you don't have that aspect. But diaphragm is very easy to me to use. So, um, anybody that can use a diaphragm turkey, it's a different style. You know, it's a sure. different read. Now, you can't take a turkey read and think you're gonna call in a. Uh, I mean, you can help make a help sound with it, but. You need a diaphragm that's absolutely made for elk hunting. But you can take an elk hunting read and call a turkey in. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. yeah. A lot easier in that direction. Yes, sir. Um, yeah. Not you're not gonna get much rasp out of it. Right. I do like right. the rasp, but right. it, but anyway. So yeah, you know, learning the calls, learning the language. It wasn't any you know podcast there, but listen to anything you can as far as trying to learn the language. But you know, the bull is he is locating. The cows, in a lot of ways, are going, you know, uh, uh, are going to be attracted to him. Mm -hmm. In the in the turkey woods, the, the turk, the, the way nature's supposed to work is the turkey sounds off, the gobble sounds off, the hens come to him. You know, right. sure. the hens come to him. You're trying to kind of defeat nature to get him to come to you, and, and elk's a lot like that too. Um, but hear him, get in close. You know find the sounds that he wants to hear same way for turkey mm -hmm. you know if if he likes to cluck keep clucking you know mm -hmm. if he likes to if he likes to cow calls keep using the cow calls you know on the elk same same deal you know do, when but, you first uh, started out did you know what you were saying though with the elk call did you know that you know the what you were actually telling the bull with cow calls or what the bull was telling you with his type of bugles and no. those kinds of things yeah no and, and that's a lot of stuff. I mean, absolutely still learning. I yes, mean, sir. you're still learning, trying to yes, pick sir. that language up. Yes, sir. But the, but the, so, and, so you just imitated more than anything, right? As you started going forward, you just imitated, you know, whatever that bull would fire off on, we're going to keep using it. Right. It, it that's, took a while. Look, that's, that's, that's basic one-on-one -on -one elk calling. Yeah. It took a while to really get the, uh, I would say the first, first few years is very limited bugle that we did it was mostly cow calls you know and and, and how much and, success uh, were you having with that oh pretty good mm -hmm. we've done pretty well with that pretty and still use it i mean it's still used i mean you know, i've heard y'all say the same thing you know if i go in and 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 he's gonna answer a cow call it's usually gonna be the first thing i'm gonna give him unless i'm locating and if he's, if that's what he wants to hear, I'm not going to blow his head off with a bugle if I don't have to, you know, I don't see the need in it. But right. That is the, right. the funnest way to hunt. Absolutely. If you can trip that trigger, you know, uh -huh. that's, that's, but, um, 
we we use cow calls certainly probably more so than we do bugles. Well, one thing I want to tell people though that are listening is is that a lot of times when they're bugling and they get these aggressive answers back to them, you know, a lot of times they think they're pushing that animal's button. And really, you know, you got a bull that's displaying and he's just, you know, he's actually sounding off to make sure those cows know that where he's at and what he's doing while they're walking away. And sometimes you think you're engaged with a bull when you're really not engaged with him, man. You you think, oh, man, he's going off. He's going off. And and yet yeah, you never hear him come else. closer. And next thing you know, you hear him what happened, way man. farther, right? Or, so he's, just, yeah, or he's that to come over to the group and you don't realize that and you keep giving him the the hey where are you at and he's like i'm over here right yeah, uh, yeah. so that's where the uh, use of a decoy comes in handy for both uh the turkey and and the elk you know they're looking for something and and when they see that visual you know they'll generally come in yeah. You know, and, so that's, that's a you know, Robert said something earlier because it's just what Chad was talking about. Robert said, you know, both elk and turkey like to hang up. It ain't that they like mm-hmm. to hang up. We just suck at setting up, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It, yeah, this, the, this, yeah, this they, setup's they, not conducive for them to keep coming forward. Yeah, they, they, want to, they want to come, see that other animal, and go to that animal. That animal has got their interest. But now mm-hmm. you've put yourself in a setup where they should be able to see you, and they don't. And at that point, Ding. something's wrong, man. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that red flag goes up for them because that's where, like Chaff talking about, that decoy. All of a sudden, they see a decoy, and it confirms visually. Don't, 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 don't both. I mean, I mean, how many times you guys seen <laughs> doggone turkeys beating up a decoy, man, because yeah. they have that visual yeah. there. And, and that's what they're wanting. They're hearing another animal. They want to see another animal. That's why you have to, you know, when you were saying location, 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 right? You understood what that meant. I don't know that our listeners understand what that means, but that means where you are locating yourself absolutely in the setup, yeah, setup. to ensure yeah. that that animal is going to end up in your efficient yeah. killing range to be able to take that animal. If that means using terrain, if that means using thick vegetation, you know, we had some fellows on the show last week that were from out, you know, up in Canada and they're hunting in Alberta. And he's like, man, we'd be 30 yards and we couldn't get a shot. Right. Well, (laughs) I'd much rather be 30 yards than, you know, a hundred yards. And, and that doggone, if I couldn't start trying to figure out number one, how to get in a situation that I can get a shooting lane with that. It's not always going to happen. That's freaking elk hunting, man. I mean, it's just part of it, but you know, it is all about how you position yourself. Are you in front of stuff to give yourself the most optimum shooting as possible? Because I, I had news for you. You sit down for a Turkey and you put yourself behind stuff where you can't get a, a way to shoot. You know, with that animal, especially if you're using a bow shotgun, you can do yeah. some things, right? You can yeah. get away with some stuff, but if you're using oh, a bow, honey. man, and very little room for air. Yeah, man. It's just, it just makes it, makes it tough. You have to put yourself where you have the best, clearest shooting lanes um, so that you have uh, lanes that you're able to shoot. So that that animal hopefully is not a frontal, because if you put the thickest in front of you, so they have to go to the sides of you, you're better off, man. And you know, we'll talk about some of those other things, but uh, go ahead uh, with some of your other stuff that you were talking about, Robert. I just, I get into this, man, and it just, it just starts flowing, <laughs> man. I can't help myself. When's the, when's the best time to call off a gobbler, dude? Like when, when you're, when you're hunting and you really, cause man, it's just like kind of in the morning, it's just like a bull going to a destination. A lot of times you're trying to get that gobbler and you just keep going away, keep going away, keep going away. Right. Yeah, it just depends, um, you know, if he's, you know, you have just, you know, we call them satellite bulls. You have, you have, you have gobblers that don't have hens, you know, you can get them right off the roost pretty, pretty easily. Just like uh, a bull, man, like, without I'm, any cows, right? Absolutely. Bull. Exactly so we're talking right. about Long mature, bull. yeah, mature bulls yeah. versus immature bulls, uh, right? A mature, Big difference. Uh, a, a, a turkey that has hens. He's going to follow them hens. Yeah. You know, what What happens in the elk woods? The lead Same cow, way. for the most part, she's, she's leading the show. She's going to take them where they want, want to go now. 
turkeys will go nest. And the turkey, when them hens go to nest, that's going to be when he's going to be the most vulnerable, you know. Now, that might not be when he's the most vocal. Right. Um, he's going to gobble on the roost more than any, for the hens to come to him. He flies down. Once he's got the hens, it just depends on the turkey, you know, his demeanor, whether he's one that wants to gobble a lot or not. But if he's got – once he gets a hen, some of them, especially early in the season when he's got a bunch of hens, he might not get but one or two gobbles off the roost and then it's done. And he's just following the hens around. And once they leave him, if you catch him about 10, 30 or so when he's, his hens done left him, he's a lot easier to kill at that point for a lot of, for a lot of cases. And elk did, hunting can be did the you same apply much. that to elk hunting as well? Yes, we have killed, uh, we've killed bulls in the middle of the day also. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I don't sleep in. <laughs> you know, I'm going to be out there trying to be on them right, for right. sure. And we hunt a little different area. I don't, you know, I've never, everything I've ever hunted is Colorado and, and it's rough. We hunt rough terrain. So, you know, it's not a glass in place. You're not going to watch them. You're not going to, you know, you're talking some of them. It'll take you all day to get from one Canyon Oak across the Canyon. If you, to even get over there, um, you know, 2000 foot elevation drop and gain, uh, in, uh, I like Robert. <laughs> no, I, I'm getting too old for it though, Cole. Uh, but anyway, it's it's uh, and that's the best way to keep your buddies from not taking your spots to go to places, <laughs> go places they go. can't go. <laughs> Absolutely. But, um, that's it. So it, it's you know, I, I hear a lot of the elk hunting of uh, we pattern them, we know where they were going to be at, and places I hunt they'll bed in any any little small flat place they can find you know it's not it's just not it's not any open terrain pretty much uh i sent something in way back i don't forgot it's been a couple of years ago it, that i kept hearing um i'm gonna say the, the the elk bro gang talking about well if you hear somebody uh at night a bugle on top of the ridge at night that's somebody or, or whatever, because they elk feed in the valley. Well, that's really not the case where we hunt. They hunt, they do a lot of feeding on the plateaus on top. And, and a lot of times they bed in the, in the valley. So it's just a, just a terrain that we hunt. Um, you know, it, it, and that changes the landscape changes. I know that, but as sure. far as, as, well far as, the as yeah, far as where we're at, um, if you can figure out, a, or, or we do a lot of go to hey we know especially areas we know well you learn that hey maybe you run them out of there one day and you know hey this is a bed spot or you find the beds and you know you might slide into those and do a blind calling sequence to or breeding sequence to try to get a bull out and he may come in silent we kill silent bulls that way too you kill silent turkeys that way you know but yeah. you got to be where turkeys are do you think and that's you gotta, kind of a polarity there then with the turkey and the elk is you know we you hear us talking about maybe not necessarily putting a elk to bed but maybe night bugling right and getting that response and be like okay boom that that that's where they're going to be in the morning right same thing right. with like a, you get a shock gobble off of turkey from slamming your truck door or whatever and they boom they announce off you know exactly okay he's in his roost right there um, hit that's a little big alcohol. Versus, there you go. Right? Grinders tuning in. Thank you for listening to the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Podcast. Our goal is to share our knowledge and help you flatten that learning curve so that you too can have some of the very same incredible experiences that have given all of us here at Elk Bros a lifetime of memories. If you like what you hear or see, you can get all of this information plus so much more from our base camp elk hunting training camp, the first in a series of online courses from our Blue Collar Elk Academy. Our base camp training camp allows me to use my coaching style and share almost 40 years of elk hunting experiences successfully hunting elk on public lands as well as over 20 years guiding hunters of all ages and experience levels. 
This course will be like nothing you have ever experienced in concept and structure using success-based coaching techniques that will elevate your confidence and skill sets. Our camp will prepare you specifically from that final moment most in your control, those final minutes or seconds the elk is in front of you, backwards through each step and level, allowing you to see, visualize, understand, and relate every coaching point to what lies ahead, the next step, the next thought process, the next success. Because y'all, you've already been there. You know what it looks like. By tapping my 30 years of teaching and coaching experience, our camps are developed considering multiple learning modes with text, visuals, audio, as well as video. And base camp will benefit those new to elk hunting all the way to the 10 to 15 year vet. So if you are looking for that one thing to help you fill that tag this year, invest in the most important piece of equipment there is, you and your elk hunting knowledge. You can find the Blue Collar Elk Hunting Academy and the Base Camp Training Camp at elkbros.com. That's E-L-K-B-R-O-S dot com. Keep dreaming of the screaming, believing and achieving, and most of all, keep grinding. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, you know, elk don't climb trees, of course, and, and he he might not be right there. But, but yeah, turkey... If you catch him fly up, you you in business the next morning. I well, mean, and and it's the same thing with the uh, with the elk. You know, the only thing you got to realize is you got to know where if there is some kind of winds in the evening, they might move from one spot into the wind to another. But they're generally right. going to stay in that area because they're going to their night beds, man, and they're going to their night feed. Right. And I and I remember when you sent in something about that about the plateau, Robert. And I believe we even talked about that on the next show after you sent that. You did. In because you did. Because what happens, that, not bad for, I'm 60, man. And my memory's still I, well, there, huh? I remember that episode. <laughs> yeah. And, and what we were saying is the same thing happens for us in that, you know, we have Mesa country that goes up to mountains. So a lot of times those animals are bedding on the side and coming up on top of the mesas to feed. And then right. sometimes they'll just head to, they'll stay in those areas of thick oak brush or yeah. they'll start working up ridges or they'll drop down. It just depends on the weather's good. where they're getting the protection, where the feed is, you know? So, uh, well, but I think what we we're trying to say on the, on the night bugling was if, if, you, if you're in that freaking Colorado country, man, and a lot of times that you've got someplace down there that's difficult and it's a nasty hole and you know, it's down there and you get a night bugle down in there. It is most likely not a hunter. Right. right. That's right. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Dan in the holes there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> right. Absolutely, man. But I, I mean, the night bugling, because a lot of these critters, they feel safer when everybody's in their tents and everybody's gone and nobody's in the woods and they're going to give you some bugles at night. It's a great way to locate. And I mean, we've stayed on them from about 1130 at night until daylight the next morning, just moving with them all night long. Right, so, right. You know, or, uh, or the 11 o'clock till one o'clock PM midday, midday bugle in the yep. midday cobble. Right. It's the same oh, thing. Yeah. Get put up at camp by 10 o'clock that day. And I don't know how many times me and Kyle have gotten into the, the biggest rut activity ever in the, between like 11 and one o'clock. It's crazy. Right. Absolutely. I get so, their bed. I've seen it firsthand. So we're talking about the similarities is the calling using a diet. Now, was it easy for you to go to elk calls having used diaphragm for turkey calling? Yeah. I, I mean, I thought it was fairly easy, you know, right. as long as you had something to listen to because you've already figured out how to seal the call, you know, that, that piece of it is just changing the tone, but that, that was pretty easy for me. I don't, I think anybody that can use a turkey diaphragm can use elk diaphragm. You know, I really believe that. And vice that. versa. I mean, I use my, yeah, my absolutely. elk diaphragm to call turkeys, right? So. Yep. 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 Um, and, and we talked about, you know, the, the midday stuff we've talked about, um, the setup. Buddy, one thing we didn't talk about buddy calling, you know, I, we do that elk hunting all the time, and that's certainly we do that turkey hunting also. Mm -hmm. I don't set up quite as far away from somebody turkey hunting, and, and usually that's just because of terrain, but mm -hmm. um, most of the time I don't carry a gun. I, I, I don't got to the point that I just assume, you know, somebody I call for other people, a lot of times I don't have a gun, and, and 
a lot of times you end up with a turkey in your lap and the shooter can't shoot. So, <laughs> so I end up a lot, a lot closer to it. And that you just got to set up for that. But, but you know, that certainly works elk hunting too, but it works just as well with turkeys back off, have a buddy call for you. Um, that way the turkey's looking for, for the, the caller. He ain't worried about the shooter walks by the shooter and the shooter, you know, does what he's supposed to do. So that certainly works in both, both avenues of you elk had a, and you had a decoy into that mix too. And it can yeah. kill her. Yeah. I've never, I've never used an uh, elk decoy. Never done that. Um, I use them. I use them in situations. I, I do use turkey decoys, just like the youth hunt we had Saturday. Uh, I did use them um, and I'll use them for certain things and trying to get a bow shot or, but once once the foliage gets out, and and you're in thick thick cover, they can be more trouble. You'll find yourself moving up thirty yards, put decoys down. Well, if I'm thirty yards closer to the animal, I want to sit there. You know what I mean? I just seem to sit there and not not try to get decoys and back off. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm talking about in a buddy system. If you've got your collar back behind you that flashes a decoy. Oh, right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So just to give them something to pull. I mean, I've had a bull bugling that predator decoys right by awesome. my hunters at 10 yards, man. They, they're just so fixated on that decoy up the hill. And, and we, we don't like to use decoys where we have to stick anything because we lose our mobility. We like to right. have decoys that will mount on the front of our bows or that we're holding if we're back on a partner setup like that. And what you were talking about as far as set, you know, how far you set up from your partner, it's not that far with Turkey. Well, it, that's going to depend on that person's ability as an elk hunter as well, because as a guide, I find myself everywhere from being on that person's shoulder to being maybe only just a little bit behind them to if I have confidence in they and them knowing right. how to move, when to move, uh, then I'm able to get off on them because they know to put themselves in position to be able to right. get a shot. But not everybody's like that, you know. So yeah, well, another thing that I said. In it, and I feel this way. I, I like to certainly a turkey. Once you see him, and once he's committed, you got to stop calling. You got to um, be quiet. You got to be. You got to let him look for you. You know, let him. He's committed at that point. And, and one peak, he knows. He knows anyway what tree you're sitting beside, sure. pretty much. And you got to let him look for you. And I think it's the same way there. Like yeah. Where where I've changed that though, Robert, is that I've actually taken bulls that I saw that. I don't know if it was a dumb bull or what, but they started going the wrong way or they got disinterested and started to turn off. And so, oh, yeah, I, yeah. so I use my grunt tube pointing back behind me and I'll actually, I've aimed it and steered a bull in the direction I want him right. to come so that, you know, yeah. I bounce it off to the side just to get him turning and coming in. Oh yeah. Room. Yeah. You so, have to do that. But if he's, if he's committed coming, he's committed, right. You know, yeah. Right. But, Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. You got to steer him use use the calls as you have to you know you got to do it in that situation what about closing the distance you know i mean what are the similarities that you found there between turkeys and once you've got one that sounded off and you know that it's there you know how hard do you go after closing that distance man go in uh quiet on a turkey you go in just as quiet as you can get as close as you can mm -hmm. that you have we a good setup yeah, yeah. Well, we I do. say you, you can actually you, make you can actually make noise, and you don't want that turkey oh, yeah. to see you either. Yeah. Man, Absolutely, and, uh, a turkey that sees so, you, it's over. So let's do yeah, that. Let's segue that, man, because you said you've got to be quiet, right? So let's talk yeah. about where the two differ, and we have three areas that we're going to talk about them different. That's scent, sound, and sight, right? Yeah. So take it away, there, boss. And this is the reason I wrote in just to kind of help listeners. Um, I thought it would be a good, you know, smell. You hear everybody, every podcast, everything you listen to is uh, elk's nose. Um, us Eastern guys, when I'm telling somebody about elk hunting, I tell them that a elk that a elk's nose is better than a, a nanny doe. You know, the old long head, white tail doe. <laughs> Anybody no white doubt. tail hunts, no doubt. No but doubt. I think an elk's nose is better than that. So no that's, that's how you kind of relate to that. I've always said if a turkey could smell, you'd never kill one. You couldn't kill one. <laughs> I, I don't think you could kill it. 
Um, I, and I'll flip that and I'll say if an elk could see like a turkey could see, I don't think you'd ever kill one of them. Could either. never so, kill one. <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. So exactly. we all we all in the in the differences, man. But smell, everybody talks about that. But both those animals have a weakness though, and that is that they will come to a call. And absolutely you know, that you know, that's the one thing, whether they can smell or whether they can see. You know, I mean, you're right. I mean, we had a saying that, you know, any Indian can get a deer, but it takes a chief to kill a turkey with a bow, right? So, uh, <laughs> because right. you just drawn on them boogers. It's not that they were so smart. Oh, yeah. They just walk around scared the whole life, right? right. So, right. you know, well, everything, Every, everything absolutely, everything's trying to, I'll tell you, my, my first probably turkey hunting experience, my dad, my dad was, pretty much i'd say pioneer turkey hunting in this area started when we first had a season you know it won't any books no videos no nothing you know you yeah he'd set up he had to learn that he couldn't set up behind the tree you know he had to get in front of the tree you know same things that that everybody gets told now you know or watch the video to see we were it was the opening day of turkey season um you had this it was a public area that a lot of people hunted in. It wasn't a lot of turkeys right here. So I can remember numerous times that it would be a turkey goblin and it would be four people around the column. I mean, you know, you hear everybody, you hear him call, well, he might answer, but we all around it sounds kind of dangerous, but it just, that's just the way it was. You know, it just wasn't a lot of turkey. So um, it was opening day of turkey season. We had been to one place and we ended up at this public area and this turkey's goblin. So me, my dad said, we're going in this way. And my dad's the type that, that, you know, you know, my kids, I put them in my lap. I'm talking to them. I'm, my dad's like, you get over at that tree, you kill a turkey. If you make mistakes, that's how you're going to learn. You know, that's just yeah. the way, that's yeah. just his, his style. Sure. So we slide in. I can hear three other people calling. We slide in from a corner nobody's on. We sat there. I got my little 16 gauge laid across my lap. He done told me how to set up, but I got it across my lap. My dad slips in there. He makes a couple of little, little bumps on the hen, on his diaphragm. And I look, here his turkey comes. I mean, within minutes, he called him away from these other three people. His turkey comes down the hill, comes down the hill. I'm sitting there. I'm mesmerized. I move my gun literally two inches. But, 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 he run and gone. My dad stood up, didn't say a word, stood up and took off walking to the truck. <laughs> mad. You know, he was mad. He done, done his part and I didn't do mine, right? So, and, and it, as so I'm going back, well, in this huge rainstorm, you know, we soaking wet, getting back. You know, he didn't hardly speak to me all the way back to the truck. I'd never killed a turkey before. Did I learn a lesson there? Absolutely. I learned a lesson that I got to have that gun up and be ready. But here was the funny thing about that story. About a week later, um, we at my, my, my grandfather's house, which is his, my dad's father-in-law and they get to talking Turkey stories. Well, my, my grandfather's telling about where he was at on opening day. Well, guess who one of them three people. <laughs> and, and he said, we're in there calling this Turkey and, and, uh, a hen came in and took him away. Mm. My dad, my dad looked at me and winked. And then never told him any different. And I ring my father, my grandfather went to his grave. He never knew any different. But I learned a valuable lesson there that that um, you're not going to fool a turkey's eyes, at least by moving. You, you know, you they they're just not going to tolerate it. I tell you something else they won't do that elk will do. You know, I, you know elk's deadly flaw is, you know, he takes off running. You cow call or you you can stop him. He'll turn around and look. That ain't happening with a turkey. Probably I'm so. gonna tell you that right now. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> he, he is. He is. They gone, gone. in another county. Yeah, yeah. And Gilbert said it on on a on a hit it on the head. You know, everything wants to eat a turkey. You know, I can remember following my dad through the woods, and you break a stick, and that he stopped, turned that head back, and looked like he's gonna. Boy, you better not break another <laughs> stick. Well, anything yeah. that breaks a stick is a is a predator to a turkey. Yeah, huge different with elk. I like to make noise with elk. That's, that's that puts real. That puts makes my setup more realistic. Realistic. You know, you know, elk are very noisy. You, you just that is a huge difference. So you got elk. You got turkey hunters that go to the elk woods. That's nothing wrong with sneaking. 
on any animal, okay, uh, in a lot of ways. But noise can help you in the elk woods too. And you don't have to be tipping and slipping. When it's time to move, it's okay to move and break a stick or two. Mm-hmm. It's not going to hurt anything. You can't do that turkey hunt. So it, it, it tends to make turkey hunters freeze up in the elk woods. It, it, it makes them, well, I'm, gonna be, I'm scared to go down there. It's, I'm going to be too loud. I'm going to spook it. I'm going <laughs> to bump it. You know, it, 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 it makes you be timid right. um, because that's what you grew up doing. And, and, and I'll segue into to sight in the email that I sent Joe that's, I think that's probably hurt. I've lost more bulls to that. And I have anything in, in, in because of that movement, because of that two inch movement of my gun barrel that I set on that Turkey that run away, Turkey hunters lock up in the elk woods. <laughs> that's, you know, I heard Joe, I had jo- heard Joe say, well, if I've got a guy that I know he will position himself as he needs to, to get the shot, you can't position yourself as a Turkey hunter. So if mm-hmm. that's the way you, you, if, if that's your game is turkey hunting, you go to the elk woods, they, you will sit there and I have, I've done, Let him walk I'm right locked up. You. Yeah. Scared yeah. to move. Oh, yeah. Won't, won't draw. They, they absolutely. Won't draw. Yeah. They won't absolutely. draw their boat. It, 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 it absolutely. Lean in a thousand well, you times. might. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy, but it's because of what's ingrained in you from turkey hunting. Sure. That, you can get by with it in the elk woods. Mm-hmm. I got a story for you because just it matches both that sound and the sight. Because I, I was hunting with a buddy of mine, Eric Dunn. Uh, I was calling for him. We were getting in. We had bulls that went off. We had a convergence of several different herds that were coming together. Wind is just right for us. It's not hardly any breeze. And it's what it's at that time of morning. And it's flat enough that you really either have scent pulling or going up above you instead of going to them because we was so dead scent wise. And we're moving along and we've got, I mean, we're in these jack pines. And if I don't know if people understand what a jack pine is, but they're only like, you know, five, seven, 10 foot high. And a lot of times they're real bushy and you can see a little bit underneath of them or through them, not a whole lot. It's a, it's a big screen. And we're walking through there and you can see elk legs in front of us on the sides of us. We got bulls screaming on the side. We got bulls screaming out front. We got bulls screaming off to the left. And as we're coming in there, I can see the legs and there's a bull that's screaming that I know is within 50 yards of us and we just need to get to him so we can get the shot and and i'm like come on and i'm walking and i'm seeing elk legs walking through those jack pines on the sides of it and eric goes they're going to see our legs and i'm like they don't know we're not elk <laughs> and, you don't know we got legs yeah man and yeah. i'm just like you just walk at the same pace i am nice and relaxed make noise don't worry about it and i mean we walked in amongst and right up to that bull and set up because they hear the noise they're hearing they've got all this scent around us from all these other elk they got animals mewing and bugling and you're just in that working man it is you you just got to be the herd man be the elk if you lock up everything walks away and disappears and you just hear sounds going off you have to get in and get yourself in position and i mean he ends up shooting a beautiful bull in there at i think it was like about 38 yards in there and it was like a 346 bull beautiful bull but i i can remember him you know i'm like i'm like come on like this you know and he he looks at me like they're gonna see our legs <laughs> well, uh, yeah <laughs> don't know we got legs <laughs> that's what i love so much about elk hunting is whenever i finally figured out how much noise i could really make yep I run my big ass through the woods yep. yeah, and a right. lot of <laughs> guys freeze up and they don't make any noise. The elk are like, where the hell did they go? The elk go. Yeah. Where did the, the elk go? go that was just making all that yeah. noise? Y'all, whenever yeah. I'm calling and I'm in a situation, I'm calling for somebody. I've got a stick in one hand. I've got my diaphragm in my mouth and I've got a rock in this hand. You know why? It's so that I if I need right. to steer that elk or I need to get him to do yeah. something without making a, a verbal call, I can chunk that rock and make it sound like there's elk moving around behind me. Like it's uh, not like you need oh, to be yeah. silent. It's really sometimes the more noise and not calling, but just audible noise, stomping right. the ground, kicking the stump. Make some call. Yeah, make, yeah. Yeah, yeah. make it 
some stuff Calm rustling down. around over there. Elk aren't just out there, you know, going Slipping crazy, up on everybody. Time, moving yeah. around and doing stuff, you know, without ever even saying anything. That's what I love right. about making. I, I can run, not like a white. Yeah, and, I can't and it, tell you how many times I've watched guys just lock up when a bull walks in on them. And oh, you're like, absolutely! I'm looking at him. I'm like, what are you? Oh my God! Why is that bull looking at you, not getting <laughs> shot right now? You know, I'm like, what? What are you? What are you waiting on? You know, it, it's. But it is a mesmerizing creature. Okay, I will say that the difference is is looking you're looking up at a Clydesdale horse and the other one you're looking down there around like a basketball on the ground huge difference man this other one's got these menacing giant antlers that are coming back off of his head and they're just majestic creatures and then and you, by the time you figure out oh my gosh here's what I got to do a lot of times that that moment is passed because you you don't understand how to seal it up. You don't understand how to finish, right? Uh, whereas turkey hunting, man, it's about all the right timing, right? Everything, especially bow hunting a turkey, you got to be able to draw on that mm -hmm. rascal and get him killed. And listen, uh, if you've ever tried to draw on a wild turkey, <laughs> it's not easy, especially if you are not right. in a ground pop-up blind or something yeah. like that. It's super hard. And I, I've been, yeah. I've, you know, been able to do it. And there's some of my most treasured trophies I've ever killed because I got drawn. I fooled right. that rascal and I got him, you know. What's the difference there with a turkey versus an elk, right? With an elk sitting there staring sure. you down, what can you do? You got to draw. Draw. You can, yeah, you got to draw. He's yeah. looking have, right. You have to. If you a turkey's staring at you, absolutely. Done, done it a yeah. million times. Done it a million times. Turn bull and, looking and, straight at you, draw your bow. If he decides, you know, we hunt in partners a lot. So if the bull decides he wants to booger nine times out of ten, I've got a guy with me that can either bugle or I have a diaphragm call in my mouth all the time. I can stop him. This year, the bull I killed, he took off running because he we spooked him and he took off running. I cow called at him and he stopped at 53 yards and we put him down, you know. Right. But he'd already been spooked. You know, so you ain't doing that with a turkey. Well, I'm if, telling you right now, you spook enough. that turkey, if, he's out. If if that bull yeah. has not smelled you, you have a chance. If that bull hasn't smelled you, yeah. because if he sees movement, right. a lot of times he's not sure what that movement is. You know, if he's heard a noise and he and he's not sure about that, you can actually have two of those things that, you know, that can go a little bit wrong for you and get it. And I want to tell you this too. The more animals that you have in the situation, you know, I've heard people say there's a lot of eyes in there, but the more animals that you have, the more you can get away with as far as noise and movement as well. That's because something to remember, you know, it, because that animal's used to other things going on around them. It doesn't mean like you can just start going through them, you know, but look, I've given up the queen so I can get <laughs> the king, right? So, I mean, there's times where I've gone and let myself spook other animals because just because an animal spooks and starts to run, that bull doesn't always know why. Now, if he's with some cows and that whole group takes off, right. he's going to start following them just because he's going to follow them. You know, it's not that he's freaked out necessarily. He's just going to go with the herd because that lead cow is taken off. But I have actually spooked. I, I have spooked groups of five raghorns that came in on top of me with another bull coming down. As soon as they spooked, I screamed like I was a bull that was after him. And he thought, man, well, man, they just got another bull poking them down there and he just keeps coming. So depending on the situation, you can have things and happen for you and get away with things as well. Just because you, because you spook one elk doesn't mean that it's game over. You know, you even got that bark chuckle right. that you can throw in there sometimes. Yep. Too. Right. You know, yeah. We've done you know, that. Yeah. There's, there's different things that you, you ain't can bark do. Chuckling, no, you ain't bark chuckling. No kind of, there's nothing you can do call wise when you but when there might be 20 turkeys around you and if oh, one yeah. of them hens spots you oh, man it's over <laughs> you, ain't, it you ain't you ain't gobbling you ain't doing nothing it is done son they're out <laughs> if that's what you grew up doing in the east and and i'm gonna yes. argue that the eastern turkey is probably to me i think one of the toughest ones it is but it, it especially one that's been hunted a little it is so hard of a of a habit to break 
to think yeah. that you can walk right up in the middle of it. And that's why that's kind of why I sent the email. That's that's something that I struggle with. We had two uh we killed two bulls this year on an archery hunt and uh, me and my partner kill two 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 rags. We don't we don't discriminate. If, if the good Lord puts them in front of us, we'll put them on the plate. But <laughs> if if uh but we had two bulls we were calling for for the the other two guys and uh one was my brother, and, and I just kicked myself over, and I, I, I'm pretty hard on myself, but I, I look back on it, you know, and things I should have done different, and, you know, I should have been a lot more aggressive. Um, you know, you, you you worry about the wind. You worry about the thermals. So you got that in the back of your mind. You're like, okay, he's right here. I don't want to blow him out. Can I get in there? And we made a pretty aggressive move on the bull, um, but another bull came in and, and he left his cow, the big bull left his herd bull, left his cows to go to him. That should have been me triggering that instead of that small bull. We, right. I said, we got to go. So we run in at that point and, and I had my brother out front and I called and, and the smaller bull started coming. The big bull is irate. He is not having it. Well, he come, my brother looks and, and, here comes a school bus is what he said. He said, there's a school bus coming down the hill. Here I am calling the, 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 you talking about a decoy. Well, the big bull saw the small bull. He hooked him. He said, you the one day here bugling. He hooked him and run him out of our life. So we were close, but I should have been in there sooner. And I should have been more aggressive and been in there sooner and got, and got in his grill. But I was sitting back, letting him make the move instead of me making the move. Yeah. And, and, and part of that is because of the way I, you know, that's just the way my hunting has been, you know, you, you, you have a, you ain't going to do that with a turkey. You're not, you know, so it's, it's very much different. Yeah. So, so you know, to list those smell. And man, you got to pay number one scent is the biggest mistake that most guys make coming out here sound. You can't be worried about being quiet when you're hunting elk. It's not a white tail. It's not a turkey. And in sight, you can get away with so much more. And in fact, when that elk is moving is the best time for you to move move. because when they're moving, everything's moving around them. Okay. So that's things to remember. Now let's talk about the non-negotiables. Let's talk about the sobering things. Let's talk about the things that, you know, when people say that elk, you know, turkey hunting is like elk honey, that this is the thing that separate it. And what would you guys say some of the number one things are that separate turkey hunting from elk hunting? Blood trailing. <laughs> oh, there's a good one. Yeah. Blood trail. I mean, most of the times, hopefully, you're going to see your turkey drop inside, either that or you're going to be <laughs> running after it as fast as you can to get a bolt sucker <laughs> before he gets in flight. Um, whereas the elk, you don't even want to move <laughs> until yeah. until you, first of all, you take your shot and, and then you listen and assess the situation and watch what happens with the bull and then sit back and analyze every single piece of that before you ever take up trailing or going to recover your animal right right? big difference versus turkey hunting and elk hunting um you know i think that's a that's a huge thing whereas with turkey hunting like you know it it is what it is you go after it if it takes off running like you run after it go try to get whatever it might be you ain't never you ain't never run down a hill you ain't never run down a elk cone. <laughs> Many. <laughs> I, mean, I thought he was tough. Yeah, I've had he saying? some dang near run me down. I've had some dang near run me down. Right. <laughs> you haven't watched my latest episode on Flatlander, have you? Uh, apparently not. <laughs> I, didn't see that. I think if Cole thought he could run down an elk, Cole sure would, man. Yeah. I don't know. He's he's making me a believer what he carries out the woods. He's making yeah. me he's a tough guy. I um, he can he can get yeah. it done, brother. Well, he's right you're hitting now, on that, hell you with know. a water pistol. He's one of the first ones I call. So, I'm staying so up. Robert, what's the biggest shock for you that separates turkey hunting and elk hunting? Uh, we've already talked about that. I've I've never. Uh, I don't think a sell a uh, elk vest that you can put an elk in the back of your vest and carry it out like you can a turkey. Uh, <laughs> uh, elk is a is a big animal. Yeah, um, size, and sheer that's, size that's, of the animal. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. 
you know, that's that that's a sticker shock if when you get one on the ground for sure. Um, and you know, it is and how about the country we hunt them in. Oh mm-hmm. my God! Yeah, that that is unbelievable. So much bigger. Not saying you couldn't hurt turkeys that way, but um, yeah, the the country is, you know, and and that's a, that is probably one of the most intimidating things for most people when they come from the east out there. Well, I had a like guy the- ask me the other day. He asked me the other day. He said, uh, he said, look, man, I, I've been wanting to do it, and I tell everybody to ask me that, and I'll, I'll give anybody. I'm not going to give them my my locations like you talked about certainly, but I'll help anybody. I'll look at maps with them and do it. But, but I tell them all, I say, you know, look, you ain't getting any younger than mountains ain't getting any smaller. So go when you can. The guy said, well, how in the world do I know where to, I mean, you know, how do you keep up for public land, private land? And he was sitting there and I put on my phone. I said, dude, in Colorado, it's 25 million. I don't know. It's somewhere around that 25 million acres of public land. Well, around here, if you get a a thousand or two thousand dollar, I mean two thousand acre WMA or wildlife management area, that's 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 all they know. So everything else is private, and that's it's like you mean I can go out there and it's public land everywhere. Yeah, yeah, you know. So they have to overcome that also, you know. So and if you go to one of these, point. you you go to one of these WMAs here, the public land. Everybody's it's there. gonna be one of the everybody's there. Everybody comes to that little small area and it's it's like, well, how am I gonna get away from people? Well, you need to go out there and see it. <laughs> That's all you mm-hmm. tell them because yeah. it's big country. That is so true. Um, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And and that's probably one of the reasons that you got caught hunting elk and killing elk with a fanny pack on, because that's basically all you needed before. I mean, you know, you throw a bird over your shoulder and you hit back, but now you kill one of these critters and you got a fanny pack on it. So that's a little tougher pack job, right? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no doubt. And mm-hmm. it's, it's a lot easier to move through the woods like that, but you're not planning for success, right? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. We hunting out West. I mean, you're going to take, you know, some guys that live out there to have more time, but like, uh, Mr. Knuckles and myself, we get seven to 10 days, you know, and that's probably long for a lot of people to go out there and hunt elk, you know, and where he's at and where he's from around the house, he probably hunt turkeys every weekend. Well, the preparation, yes, exactly. the preparation that you had to put, you know, you think about that guys that hunt turkeys, man, they, they can leave the house and drive the truck over. They go out there and they hunt birds just about anywhere. Right. And, yeah. you know, you've got guys that are coming out on a five day hunt or a 10 day hunt, you know, 14 day, very few get to hunt the whole season. Not, you know, there's only so many people that can do that and they are working from now until their hunt to prepare both physically, mentally, shooting, absolutely. Equipment. You know, I mean, there's so much time and investment put in that just to get that one opportunity, man, or hope to get that one opportunity. You know, the the knowledge set that they've got to get get from that as well. So that is huge. And you know, because they have to be ready for that country that is so much bigger and so much steeper. And let, let me let me tell everybody out there, I want you to look go look on your onyx or on your base map or any of those i want you to find an area in colorado and look at it on that map and i want you to look at those topo lines and then i want you to look at it in uh google earth and i want you to look at that and 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 you're going to look at it and you're going to go hmm that's not so bad (laughs) bad right there (laughs) yeah and i you know one thing i am telling you is it's a lie okay do not let that fool yeah. you it is it that's a fool's tale right there it is going to be three times farther it's going to be five times steeper and it's going to be stuff that you got to climb over you got to walk through and that's why you got to learn things about how to follow elk trails and how to follow contour yeah. lines how to get the wind right you know it there is so much more to it out there that so like gilbert you know gilbert says it all the time he's like i'm not the i'm not the most athletic person in the world but you know he gets it done at his pace but there's another thing that you're super strong at Gilbert, that's because you're mentally strong, yeah, right? Absolutely. You, you don't I'll have take to be it any day. Superstar athlete to go out there and get it done, right? 
as long as you have the mental capacity to be able to push forward and, and keep going, even whenever you have a failure or even wherever you think it's not going to happen, you got to keep pushing forward. Yeah. That's it. You just, you can't give up. Go ahead. I tell everybody that, uh, on a, if that I'm prepping or trying to get them to go, you don't have to beat the mountain. You got to beat yourself. And that's, that's, that's what it's all about. You, yeah. Day you, three, four, and five, you got to beat yourself. Absolutely. <laughs> the and, first and two you, days you're running on sheer adrenaline. <laughs> you know, but day, day three, four, damn. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, yeah. And I've heard Gilbert say it numerous times, you know, having the right people with you because, Everybody hits that wall, and I, yeah. I tell everybody, you're gonna you're gonna get punched in the nose, and you're gonna yeah. hit a wall, and yeah. and you need you need a a brother out there that's gonna pick you up and say, you know, get over yourself today, yeah. yeah. And tomorrow it might be me, but um, you gotta have you know you gotta have a good partner with you, I I think, and to to help you get through those those times. That's also when you gotta learn to love where you're at. I mean, again, that mental capacity is sometimes people get so fixated on having to, you know, I haven't seen this elk or they start getting frustrated instead of enjoying where they're at in the moment that they're in, you know, and, and just slowing down and, and looking around, like you said, even when you're packing an animal out, Cole, you know, so yep. you just got to stop and enjoy what you're doing. Cause that's why we're doing this, man, because we love yeah. to be out there, you know, um, one thing I want to bring up Joe. as well is the success considerations, man. You know, we talked about it earlier from our uh, in our mailbox, but man, after the kill, you know, how far is too far? I mean, I don't have to worry if I go in two miles for a Turkey sometime, but you know, depending on Going how that, back, yeah. <laughs> you got, you got to mm-hmm. think about getting that out, the physical demand, you know, chaff, what is too far for you? If you were by yourself, man, Oh, uh, right now. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it just, <laughs> yeah, we, we, we know you're in a different situation right now. Right. Yeah. But prior to having to battle cancer and, and being able to walk again, what was your, what was your too far distance? Too far. Uh, well, pre GPS days, probably uh-huh. uh, a couple of miles. Uh, now that, now that you have Onyx and, you know, GPSs and everything, uh, uh, I would say five, but you know that that's kind of stretching it, because uh, you know I, you know I weigh like 150 pounds, so one hind leg probably weighs as much as me. I got a leg <laughs> that weighs that much. <laughs> <laughs> so get, so getting that far away from uh, from a vehicle or you know if we're separated. Uh, that would have been a, a pretty tough task. Well, yeah, you know, and that's walking that. on flat land. It could be a tough task. Yeah, so, add yeah. up and down oh, to that, sure. right? Yeah, right. So it depends on on the situation. Also, Joe, what about our equipment that we use? You know, our equipment's so different that we use for turkey hunting versus, uh, you know, setups the whole nine yards for what we're going to hunt turkey with versus what we're going to hunt elk with. Is yeah, you know, I've got a lot of buddies that will use a recurve on turkey that you know. They're making those close shots. Uh, they usually on decoys or they're using a guillotine arrow or something like that, you know, and, yeah. and I mean, big expandable. Yeah. 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 Expandable. And I mean, I can elk, get away with it on yeah. a turkey. Yeah. And, and right. there's some things you're, you know, you got to have good equipment to, that, you know, that you can put two holes in an elk and you're, you got to think about your shot selection so much more, man, because the goal is not, listen, the goal is not to put an arrow in the animal. That's not the goal. The goal is to put an arrow where that animal is going to die as quick and as, as efficiently as possible. That's the goal, not to just get an arrow in an animal. That's ridiculous. It's unethical. It's irresponsible. If you're not able to put an arrow in a spot that you know is going to be a lethal and mortal shot with the opportunity of putting that animal down, hopefully what you want is within seconds, Yeah. you know, yeah. then, been, you know, been that's so fortunate to watch that happen. Mm-hmm. They dead in less than 12 seconds. I mean, put a, put a double lung on them and boom, they are done. I mean, right. 12 seconds feet up. It's time to go take, take yes. their back straps out, man. He has nothing better for a bow hunter to see that animal go down in your sight. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Yep. Absolutely. And, and the other thing is, man, that's different is you had better have a plan for caring for the meat. 
I yes. mean, you, you had better figure out mm-hmm. how you're going to cool it, how you're going to process it, how you're going to handle it. You've got to know what you're doing because that's why you're hunting. You, you're responsible for taking the best care you can to get back every bit of that meat as possible. And, you know, we're talking uh, on our average animals is going to be between 250 and 300 pounds, depending on how big it is. You start talking rosies, you're going to get over that 300 pound limit like that. But that's a that's a lot of meat, and that's not talking bone, man. That's not talking head. That's not talking cape. You know, if you want to get that stuff out of there, that adds a whole nother part to the journey right there. And uh, being able to take care of that as well. You know, if you're planning on, you know, you look back there, and and uh, Robert has that uh, European up there. It looks beautiful, man. The you know, be able to being able to do that changes yeah. the game a little bit because you don't have to worry about the hide but if you're planning on doing a mount or anything like that now that's a totally different type <laughs> Ooh, of game. absolutely so, another hundred pounds or more absolutely that's 200 pounds yeah 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 you know you know the other 80 pounds yeah i'm i i feel like you know i know y'all probably seen this and I, I tell this to people also is you know if you pack a bull a mile it's tough as hell. I mean, it's tough. A mile's tough. But after you do it, you think, you know what? I could probably do two miles. Mm-hmm. And before you know it, you, you, <laughs> the bottom line is your body's tougher than, than most people realize it is. You know, you know, yeah, you can, absolutely. You put your most people mental block and say, I ain't going in there and killing nothing. I'm glad they that way. I really am. I'm glad yeah, people won't yeah. go in the hole that I us. go into. Absolutely. Yeah. But, yeah. but, um, you know, mentally, you, you just can't mental toughness. You don't have to be mentally tough to go kill a turkey, but you better bring your mental game if you're gonna step in the elk bushes. I'm just gonna tell you that now. That's, that's, yeah. Do you get more out of testing yourself oh, in absolutely. the elk woods than you do absolutely. in the turkey woods? Yeah, absolutely. Would you absolutely. say? Your now, I love the challenge. Right. I love the challenge of it. I've outsmarting any of them. I mean, I sure. love that. Sure. But but go ahead. You just asked a question about my passion. Yeah, no, I, has it less your passions for deer hunting or turkey hunting or anything like that because you are more passionate about elk hunting? We always laugh when we get back home because it's, it's usually our bow season comes in October. We always usually hunt, the, you know, September, a couple of weeks. We try to go. We get home and everybody's like, we're in the tree stand going. This sucks, man. What's the deal? <laughs> you know, we should be able to reach that. It takes us two, brother. It yeah. takes us a couple of weeks to get yeah. to get back yeah. in deer mode. Yeah, it does. It, it really does. And I'm glad it's a distance yeah. to turkey yeah. season. You know, I'm glad it's my wife will tell you it's all season because I'm doing something all the time. But um I love it all. I mean, I love it yep. all. You know, and it's it's good for all of it. And you need you need to be well rounded with all of it. But uh yeah, elk, elk hunting. Everybody yeah. says, "Man, why don't you do something?" If I went to Alaska, killed a moose. Um, it's the only guided hunt I've ever been on, and it was awesome. It was awesome. And everybody's like, "Why don't you go kill a hog? Why don't you go kill it?" I said somebody asked me the other week. I said, "I just can't do it. I didn't find what I love to hunt." And now my son, he's he, my oldest son. He said, "So, Dad, we need to go." I took him elk hunting for the first time this past year, and he said, "We need to go turkey hunting somewhere next year." And I said, "All right." You know, life's short. We'll go, you know. And uh, so, uh, but I mean, I ain't going to give up my elk All that stuff's a pacifier. It's like when you can't, you know, like your little baby that can't eat. You got to stick something in your mouth just to hold you over, right? <laughs> That's what I told him when he said he wanted to go turkey hunting. I said, you sure you don't want to go elk hunting? I mean, come on now. But uh, <laughs> But anyway, but I love my turkey too. So might come down your way. That'd be uh, awesome. We, I've, I've been to Texas yeah. before, so we might go back down that way. Awesome. Come on down. Hey, I, you know, yeah, is there anything else anybody wants to add before we uh, close this out this evening? Because I, I know we're getting real late for Robert there. I'll, I'll just say this, guys. If, if, if you got any desire at all to go elk hunting, go. Just go, man. Just go. You'll figure it out. You got podcasts like these guys. There's a lot of podcasts out there. What's the best podcast to listen to? Are you gonna really ask me that right now? <laughs> yeah, bros, if he cool. wasn't, if he wasn't, I was. <laughs> but anyway, good answer, man. Yes. That's a good answer. That bro. is absolutely, absolutely. 
Well, look, there's a but lot yeah, of them just out go, there that man. we love to listen to as well, you know, and not just ours, but there's there's a handful of them that we love, and the guys that are, are doing them are fantastic people, and they're putting out great content. But Absolutely. you know, this started this started for us a few years back, just you know, us wanting to not miss each other at elk camp all the time. And Joe's like, man, you know, we think about starting a <laughs> podcast. And I was like, well, they pay me to talk. So you know, I talk leg off wood and Indian Joe. So right, right. Yeah, too, man. <laughs> no, y'all got a Y'all got a good thing going. Keep it, keep it going. And, and it, it Thank people you, don't realize just how much, how much y'all can shorten the learning curve, you know? And, and, uh, I heard Chav say GPS, you know, to me, that's a big, you know, the Onyx, that's the biggest game, game changer. changer in the elk woods yeah. since, yeah. since I've been hunting them. Um, and, and if that don't, that gives people the confidence to go, you know, so there's no reason not to go. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I don't want, just don't go where I go. You know, y'all stay away from my <laughs> spots. But uh, no, we, we, every, everybody needs to have an elk bugle. Yeah. In, the, in the Absolutely. wheelhouse. Yeah. Once in their Everybody. life, for sure. Absolutely. Guys, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe, rate, and review. You got to go to Apple Podcasts or iTunes to review us, and you can check out more elk hunting content at elkbros.com. And if any of our listeners would like their questions answered on our show, just send your questions to info at elkbros.com. That's I-N-F-O at elkbros.com. Joe, amazing show. Robert Kent, thank you for being our guest tonight. And man, Cole Wilkes, the Flatlander in the house, uh, always (laughs) good to have our, our elk hunting coach and champion caller in the house with us tonight. And uh, fellas, like we say down here in the Lone Star State, husbands kiss your wives, wives kiss your husbands, hug your babies, keep your broad head sharp and your powder dry, and we'll see you next week right here on Blue Collar Elk Hunting. And guess and what, And for man? all our grinders out there, here is some music from our brother. Tony Wintrips closing out the show. Out the show. Peace, peace, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, peace. Robert. Thank you very much. Hey, I Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Robert. What you smoking, boy? Don't smell like the stuff my grandpa used to do When he carved them wooden ducks He gently took a puff A little bit of cherry Was drifting in the wind I can tell that he wasn't all there He didn't have much He just stared up into the sky and lit another match and he said I'm just trying to ease the pain I ain't trying to rest no pain let me be free every night I don't want to cuss or fight I don't ever see the light at the end of this tunnel is where I need to stay oh I'm trying to ease the pain said you got a minute man I said yes sir go ahead with what's on your mind he said I got a busted back and scars I got on both these legs from cutting timber way up on a mountainside that old chainsaw was slipping right through the back cut before I knew it, I was upside down and on my butt. Now I'm just trying to ease the pain. I ain't trying to raise no pain. Just let me be free every night. I don't want to cuss or fight. And I don't ever see the light. At the end of this tunnel is where I need to stay. Well, oh, I'm trying to ease the pain When you lay there at night in a sleeping bag zip tied I wonder deep inside what your story is. And 
no one knows but you Would you open up if we had a few? Lord knows the cardboard sign don't say it all He said I'd give it all again if I could do it over And this old bottle of Jack won't get me sober Cause I'm just trying to ease the pain I ain't trying to raise no cane Let me be free every night I don't want to cuss or fight I lost my kids and my wife At the end of this tunnel is where I need to stay While I'm trying to ease the pain While I'm trying to ease the pain While I'm trying to ease the pain I just want to ease the pain